Hello and welcome. If you're new to this channel, my name is Caleb Haig. I'm the director of Pronomian.com. I am also a co-host of a show called Messiah Matters. And uh, we had somebody uh, send in a video by uh, Chris Roseborough, who is, uh, he has the channel Fighting for the Faith. And um, I know Chris, I've actually, I interviewed him about um, 10 years ago now. Wow. Time flies. So I interviewed him about 10 years ago when he, uh, had done a debate and, uh, uh, Chris, I believe is doing some great work in certain areas. Uh, he basically calls out heretics, charlatans, whatever, and, uh, shows why biblically why they're wrong. Okay. So then why would I be uh, looking at anything from, uh, Chris? Well, first of all, uh, this video, I think, I'm, I've, I've watched this video. It's, it's quite long, and I don't think we're going to watch the whole thing, but um, I, I'm not sure exactly if, if uh, Chris is just uh, misunderstood or if he's taking a different approach completely. I, I don't actually know, but his video is about the festival of Rosh Hashanah, and if you don't know what it is, he's going to explain. He's going to explain what the festival is. Uh, Rosh Hashanah just means head of the year, and it is the Jewish New Year. It's one of the Jewish New Years, and we're going to talk about that here in a few minutes. Okay, so um, as I said, this is Chris Roseboro fighting for the faith, um, and I actually do plan on sending this to Chris, not that I think he'll actually watch it or respond to it or, or interact with it at all, but uh, I will send this to Chris once I'm done. Uh, recording it. Okay, so with that, all of that said, let's jump into this video. Let's take a look. Around this time, uh, it, it is the Jewish feast of Rosh Hashanah, the uh, the head of the year, the uh, the Jewish New Year, and I've noticed over the past decade that there are a growing number of people who think that this is a biblical feast, and it's not, and uh, and then people in the NAR and the Charismatic and Pentecostal movements use uh, the occasion of Rosh Hashanah to then give their New Year's prophecies, and we're going to show that this is is not a biblical practice at all. Let's stop for just a second here. I, so uh, two things. N number one, uh, Mr. Roseboro here is actually right. Rosh Hashanah itself, the term Rosh Hashanah and how uh, the Jews celebrate Rosh Hashanah, in my opinion, is not necessarily uh, biblical. And so in, in that respect, he's right. And he's going to get into what he means by that. Um, but certainly the... Uh, the idea of giving New Year's prophecies, uh, Chris nails it on this. I mean, he is absolutely right on on um, the people who are trying to give new prophecies and yearly prophecies and all these kind of things. And he's going to get into this and, and he's going to show you just how backwards some of this stuff is. Um, but along with that, I think there is a misunderstanding a little bit of, uh, the, of Rosh Hashanah which is also titled Yom Teruah. And so if you don't know what Yom Teruah is, Yom, Yom means day, Teruah means uh, a lot of people translate it trumpets, but it's actually, and that's how it's translated in the Bible uh, in certain places. Uh, for instance, Leviticus 23. However, teruah just m means like uh, uh, making sound, like a, a, a great sound, a, a large sound. Um, so Yom Teruah would be like the day of great sounding or great noise. I know that sounds weird. Let's keep going with Mr. Roseboro here. Like not even close. In fact, I'll say it up front. Uh, if you know people who are giving prophecies for Rosh Hashanah, um, they're not actually giving prophecies. They're engaging in fortune telling. Totally agree. He's right on this 100%. Preach it, brother. Yeah, I'll give you an example uh, as we move along here today. So let's uh, let's do this. Let's whirl up the desktop. Isn't this interesting? It's a video commenting on a video commenting on another video. The, the layers here are intense. And uh, we're going to head over to the 1030 a.m. Um, <laughs> service, uh, <laughs> church service at Shiloh Fellowship in Arizona run by Patricia King. And this was streamed live on September 18th. And the name of it is Hebrew Calendar and uh, Year 5783. You're going to learn a little bit of Hebrew along the way, by the way. And uh, we'll, we'll see what she has to say. This is the setup. And by the way... It, 
this is not something limited only to Patricia King. I'm only using her as an example. So if you are, are seeing in your Facebook feed or your social media feeds people who are talking about the Jewish New Year and uh, and it's several years from now, it, it'll be five, seven, eight, seven, or you know something like this. This all still applies. We're going to definitively show that this is not a biblical feast, and these people, when they try to interpret the the Hebrew meaning of that particular year, they're actually engaging in fortune telling. So, okay, so I totally agree with Chris on this so far, Mr. Roseboro. Um, and not only that, but uh, he had, doesn't even mention this. I don't know who Patricia King is. However, any congregation where a woman is the pastor or the teaching pastor or is be in the pulpit preaching. I, I mean, I say run anyway. So that, that's, in my opinion, it's not a biblical concept. And this is something that Mr. Roseboro has not touched on. Now, I don't know if Mr. Roseboro is egalitarian or not. I, I would, that would surprise me, honestly, uh, if he was. However, um, he, he may be. So, so he doesn't touch on that. But the other thing that he doesn't really get, he kind of touches on this a little bit. He touches on uh, the fact that we are in 2022 right now and not 57, whatever it is. I don't even know. I didn't. My, my Hebrew calendar years are all over the place. But he, the thing that uh, he doesn't touch on is that uh, they, the, the Jews didn't count the years when they were in exile. So no matter what, the, uh, the Jewish calendar counting is off. It is off. So um, any prophecy that they're making, I mean, there's just so many problems with this. But he's right on all of this so far. Here we go. The presence of the Lord is so powerful in here this morning, and it just gets more and more and more and more. It's just amazing, and a lot of that is because of the prayer. And if you haven't been out to the prayer meetings, I tell you, they're their own revival meetings. <laughs> they are so good. I so look forward. Whenever I have to miss one, I just groan inside because they are so good. We just come with no agenda. We just come to worship Jesus, to press into him, to press in for the more of him. And every single time, revelatory portals open up. And he speaks to our revelatory portals open up, not a biblical teaching. Uh, he's, this is, he's so right on this. I mean, it, it, he's so right on this. It, this it, to me, this is an extreme form of charismatic, like uh, like charismatic. And um, I don't know, just it, like it's almost word of faith kind of, of teaching. I mean, it, it, Roseboro's right. This is this is ridiculous. Nonsense. Every single time, relevant words, and um, you can feel the shifts coming. It's amazing. Grab a bingo card, because that's the territory we're in right now. And uh, Pastor Francisco <laughs> mentioned about being always relevant. You'll always be relevant. This house will always be relevant when you're always prophetic. Yeah. Okay, you're going to note that in Christ's church, the orders are to preach the word not to preach this stuff. So uh, we've got a big problem here. Always. When I actually don't know where Chris uh, whole, uh, falls in terms of cessationism. I believe that uh, prophecy basically ended when the canon was closed. And uh, so now, does that mean that a person couldn't get, couldn't, receive some kind of direction from the Lord, of course, of course they can. And I'm not saying that the Lord can't do what he wants. So um, if the, you know, we see prophets coming in Revelation, not the point. I basically, I think that we have the word of God now. So anytime somebody says that they're going to prophesy, I mean, I, I'm out. I'm pretty much out until, until we see some major shifts. Now, I shouldn't say I'm out because uh, I'll listen to a person but I think that 99.9% .9 of the time when somebody says that they've received a word from the Lord or something like that, um, I'm not exactly sure if I, if I accept that or not. The word of the Lord is, is found in the 66 book canon. So anyway, all right. Uh, so I, I might be more, my whole point in saying all that is that I might be even more extreme in my understanding of uh, modern day pro prophecy than Mr. Roseboro here is. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, to be honest with you, I haven't done, uh, I haven't watched a lot of uh, Chris's stuff recently, and, and that's my fault. So um, that's okay. Let's let's keep going. When you listen for the voice of the Lord and partner with what He's doing, you'll always be relevant. It's that easy. It is so easy. It's just walking with Him, right? There's no big formula or anything. And now, notice she doesn't have a Bible out. She's not going to preach the word. She's going to claim to be preaching a prophetic revelation that God gave her. So let me fast forward just a little bit. 
as she gets a little bit you know more specific now this is just the setup for where she was going and let's see what comes next well we're coming into on the hebrew calendar we're coming into the year 5783 and of course in january on the gregorian calendar we'll be coming into 2023 but once again, I've already I've already said this, but I'll just say it again uh, that that the number is somewhat arbitrary because uh, the Jews did not count years during the uh, exile. It is a. <laughs> Going to point something out here. When a church or Christians emphasize the Hebrew calendar, you know who gets left by the wayside. Jesus. So she says this is the Gregorian calendar. Okay, fine. But why is it why is it the year 2022 currently right now and why will it be 2023? 2022 years since what? You'll know we are in the year Anno Domini. That means the year of our Lord. So as Christians, Christians for the last two millennia have been counting time based upon the incarnation, the death, burial and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. That's why Christians observe this calendar that uses these dates. Okay, Chris has, has lost me just a little bit here. I agree with what he's saying. Obviously, that the date 2022 is uh, supposedly from Christ. Now, many scholars have, have challenged this. I don't want to make blanket statements. I don't have uh, scholarly works in front of me, but uh, many scholars today uh, believe that Christ was born somewhere before zero, like what zero would be, or, or one, right? That there was a mistake made and that actually Christ was born sometime in between about five and nine BCE. So I understand what uh, Mr. Roseboro here is saying. However, with that said, uh, the, Gregor the Gregorian calendar is off. And not only that, but here is, is really the big point, is that uh, even Mr. Roseboro himself, I assume, celebrates things like Easter, and Easter is not reckoned according to the Gregorian calendar. Why does it shift throughout the year? And the reason why is because it shifts after the, after the uh, Quattrodesman uh, controversy, the church fixes it on a Sunday, but they, they fix it on a Sunday closest to Passover. Passover is not reckoned according to the modern day Western calendar, the Gregorian calendar, whatever you want to say. It's reckoned according to the Hebrew calendar. And so even within the church, we see that uh, things like uh, things like Easter and Pentecost are actually celebrated according to the Jewish calendar, or we shouldn't call it the Jewish calendar. It's not the Jewish calendar. It's the Hebrew calendar. But it's reckoned according to the Hebrew calendar, not according to the Western Gregorian calendar. And so uh, there's, there's a little bit of a disconnect here, I think. I agree with what he's saying. We reckon things according to 2022 because that's essentially when Christ was born, give or take 10 years, right? Well, take, yeah, anyway. Um, but, but the point here is that no, even the church recognizes that there is some uh, benefit to the calendar that we found, find within the Old Testament, within the Tanakh. Uh, and the reason why is because God does set certain times, and he does that according to a calendar that is based on the moon. Now, I mean, we could get into a whole calendar debate here, but but ultimately it's based on the moon and the sun, and there are actually uh, leap years within that calendar and so on and so forth. I believe, personally, I believe that this is one of the things that the Jews were actually supposed to do, is to maintain not the covenants, right, to bring the covenants to the, uh, to, to the nations, and that includes the calendar. And so when the Jews are celebrating Passover, okay, well, then what do the Christians do? The Christians see Nisan 14, and they start to then uh, reckon the closest Sunday to Nisan 14. Interestingly, because of the Quattrodesman controversy, if Nisan 14 falls on a Sunday, they actually move it to the next week. That's a whole nother uh, discussion for a whole nother time. Not the point. The, but my point here is that uh, Mr. Roseboro, I think, has lost us a little bit in the fact that the, the Hebrew calendar is still relevant even to the church. So people who are, you know, they, who are claiming, well, we need to get back to that Hebrew calendar. Well, I'm going to point out that they're actually not. And I'll prove it to you biblically. Brand new year in a decade that um, presented us a new era. So it's a very, very strategic time that we are living in. As you notice, in 2020, everything shifted. And so we're, we're now inside of this decade of the pay, which is the mouth I won't... I mean, I'm responding to Chris, but this lady is just... I mean, what? What did everything change? Why did everything change in 2020? 
Was that because of the pandemic? Is that what she said? I don't know. Anyway, this this kind of stuff just annoys the living daylights out of me. Go too much into. Pay is a Hebrew letter. Uh, uh, now, but this year coming up is five seven eight three. <laughs> And in Second Chronicles 20, 20, it says that, that if we trust the Lord, we will succeed. And if we believe his prophets, we will prosper. And okay, taken out of context. Okay, does uh, Second Chronicles 20, 20 teach us that we need to hear from prophets? Okay, I, I, he's going to, Mr. Rose Burrow now is going to uh, show how this teacher, this, this woman has totally taken uh, that passage out of context. He's completely right on that. He is. And uh, he's going to basically dismantle um, the notion that uh, this is talking about listening to her uh, as a prophet. So I'm just going to fast forward here a little bit. And I want to see, he's still talking about Chronicles. So he reads this whole thing. Okay. And uh, let's see where we're at. You will succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to Yahweh and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army and say, give thanks to Yahweh for his steadfast love endures forever. And when they began to. Okay, so he's still talking about this uh, Corinthians passage, which she has totally, or uh, Chronicles passage, rather, where uh, that she has totally mutilated, right? And uh, he's showing why this just proves that she is a false prophet, is because she is misinterpreting scriptures uh, to her benefit, to, so that people will listen to her. The king, because she is twisted, Second Chronicles chapter. 20. He's right. Uh, uh, verse 22, yep. right? Yep. She's already twisted the scripture. So here, here Trust the Lord. Uh, sorry, verse 20. And in Second Chronicles 20, 20, it says that, that if we trust the Lord, we will succeed. And if we believe his prophets, we will prosper. And note how she absolutely twisted this text. Proof she's a false. Proof she's a false prophet. I completely agree. Part. And this is where kind of the rubber will hit the road. Anyways, back to the year 5783 in the Hebrew calendar. Next Sunday, <clears throat> Sunday, uh, September 25th at sundown, until Tuesday, September 27th at sundown, we will be um, celebrating Rosh Hashanah or the feast. What's really interesting about this, and this is something that uh, Mr. Roseborough does not catch, is that she actually is uh, adding the rabbinical extra day of Rosh Hashanah, which was Tuesday. Um, so... Uh, it's, it's really a, I mean, and she probably doesn't understand that, but she doesn't understand that this is an added day or maybe she does and she just is following the rabbis. I don't know. But the, the point here is that um, from a biblical perspective, there is no second day of Rosh Hashanah. So she says that it starts on Sunday night at sundown and it ends on Tuesday night at sundown. That's twofold. That's 48 hours. Rosh Hashanah was not, Yom Teruah, however you want to call it, was not 48 hours. It's 24 hours. It starts, it started on, I'm recording this on uh, September 29th. It started on Sunday night and went until sundown on Monday. Um, anyway, and I guess that's neither here nor there, but to, it just brings into question, like once again, where she's getting her information. It seems like she's, I, I don't know. It, it's uh, she's bringing in uh, the Mishnah and the Talmud. It's, it seems like of trumpets. It is called in the Bible. It is a biblical feast, not just. No, it's not. Rosh Hashanah is not a biblical feast. Okay, let's stop real quick. What does uh, Mr. Rosebro mean? And I would agree with him in this. He's going to explain that Rosh, that that Yom Teruah is not actually Rosh Hashanah, and I would agree with that. Uh, to, in some respects, but I'm going to show you why I also disagree with it. So um, what I mean by I, dis, uh, by, uh, I agree with that is that Yom Teruah, the day Yom Teruah, is never referred to in the scriptures as Rosh Hashanah. He's right about that. And so when she says uh, Rosh Hashanah is a biblical festival, uh, he's saying, no, it's not. What he's... what. I hear him meaning by that is no, Rosh, the, the festival of Rosh Hashanah is never found in the scriptures. And in that respect, in the idea of Yom Teruah being called Rosh Hashanah, uh, it's not called Rosh Hashanah in the scriptures. But he goes a little too far here. Let's watch. I'll prove it in a minute, but let's kind of get a little bit more context from her. I'll back this up just a little bit. Or the Feast of Trumpets, it is called in the Bible. It is a biblical feast, not just a Jewish feast. It is a biblical feast. And we enjoy celebrating God this year. And it's a time when the Lord has called for... Um, blowing the uh, shofar, actually, it starts with that, and calling people to repent. 
Total side note. Does it though? Uh, I don't think that anywhere in any of the texts it, it refers to a shofar. It just refers to it is a day of, of blowing trumpets. And actually the Septuagint, uh, the Greek translation of the Bible, actually refers to this not as a shofar but as blowing trumpets. Just a uh, something that's going on in my mind. It's okay. Don't, don't even worry about that. For their sins. So it's what starts, it, it begins the 10 days of awe and then finishes up with the day of atonement, which is the holiest day on the Hebrew calendar. All right. So modern Judaism, okay, which is a, a product of the Pharisees, modern day Judaism, a Judaism without temple, without sacrifices. Uh, this is not biblical Judaism. This is a Judaism that was created by, you know, by the Pharisees. Okay, so I don't know exactly where uh, Chris falls on this. However, I agree with exactly what he's saying here. What we see in modern day Judaism is not what Jesus was celebrating or what J Jesus was a part of. It wasn't what Paul or the apostles were a part of. It's uh, it, it's post destruction, and uh, when we see like the mission in the Talmud come along, this is we're talking four to five hundred years after Christ. And what I see this as, he's right on this. What I see this as is uh, the Jews attempting to retain the Pharisaic Judaism that they had uh, that they had. Uh, that they were celebrating in the face of a rising religion of Christianity, right? And so um, I, I agree with Chris on this. I don't know if he thinks that the rabbinic Judaism that we have today or uh, goes back to the Pharisees in the first century. That It sounds like he might think that. Um, and there are a lot of people who believe that. I personally don't believe that. I think that the, the, the mo more modern or medieval Judaisms that we see today actually are a product of post-destruction. Let's keep going. Who are kind of like the last people standing. <laughs> and so I'm going to point That's this right. out to you. If we go into the book of... Of, uh, let's say Leviticus 23, talking about the Day of Atonement. Since she says the Day of Atonement, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, so uh, Rosh Hashanah, 10 days of awe, and then the Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to what Leviticus 23 says regarding the Day of Atonement. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, now on the 10th day of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement. Which month? Seventh. Mm-hmm. Biblically, the Day of Atonement is not at the at at uh, the he head of the year. It's not during Rosh Hashanah, not even close. And so already we've got a problem. Now, biblically, when is the beginning of the year? Exodus twelve makes this very clear. Yep. Uh, Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, "This month, Nisan, shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you." Mm -hmm. According to the Bible, biblical Judaism, the first month of the year is immediately before the Passover. That's in the spring. Okay, so I agree with what, what uh, Mr. Roseborough is saying here. In, in fact, uh, this is what he might not know this. He, he may know this. Uh, this is actually an argument that a lot of people within the Hebrew Roots movement, the Messianic movement, they actually make this argument on why we shouldn't call this festival Rosh Hashanah is because it's not the head of the year. Okay, fair enough. However, the thing that I think he is missing is that Judaism, modern day Judaism, if or we should probably say Judaisms, uh, actually celebrate four New Year's, not just one. Rosh Hashanah is not the only new year. In fact, they uh, celebrate one at, at, on Nisan one, which is the one that he's talking about. He's right about this. And it seems that the Lord, I don't know if the Lord changed the new year or whatnot. It seems like it. There's arguments that uh, the Lord actually changes the new year from what would be Tishri when Yom Teruah is to Nisan one. Why would he do that? Because the festivals, the five major festivals actually are a prophecy of our salvation, which starts with Passover and the redemption of Israel, okay? So so he's right. Nisan 1 is the new year. Now, the rabbis add two that are not biblical, which are Elul 1, uh, which is the new year of tithing cattle. Why did they do this? Well, it seems to me that they did this because um, they would choose the cattle once the once the season of the animals giving birth was, came to a completion. So they would have to then tithe, right? They would have to figure out what they were going to tithe. So it's not biblical that uh, this is a new year, that Elul 1 is a new year, but it's understandable that they would reckon this as a new year. 
Another one is obviously the one that we're talking about, Tishri 1, which is Yom Teruah, uh, and which is considered by Judaism as the civil new year. Now, why is that? The thing is, is that Chris uh, doesn't, at least from what I've watched of this video, he doesn't interact with uh, the law of God in terms of the Jubilee year. So he's in Leviticus 23, but if he goes to Leviticus 25, 8 through 12, this is what it says. It says, you shall count seven weeks of years, seven times, seven years. So, and yeah, anyway, uh, so that the time of the seven weeks of your, of your, of years shall give you 49 years. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the 10th day of the seventh month. What day is that? Okay. On the day of atonement. You shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land. Okay, so he's right. We're in the seventh month now. We're talking about the Day of Atonement. And you shall consecrate the 50th year. Well, why would you consecrate the 50th year on the Day of Atonement? Why would you do that? And proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you in it. You shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself, nor gather the grapes from the from the undressed vines. So starting in the seventh month, you don't you leave all of your produce. So this is they're counting a year from here. This is also when all of the slaves are are uh, released, right? This is this is when all the land uh, the land goes back to the original owners, right? And uh, every seventh year the slaves are released, but not the point that. The point here is that it's reckoned when from the seventh month, not from the first month. Now, in regards to this, we actually have something a little bit like this in our own calendar, in our own Western calendar. So for instance, what is so when is the new year according to our calendar? The new year according to our can, calendar is De uh, January 1st, right? December 31st is the last day of the year, and then January 1st, new year, okay? Great. When is the new year according to the school? Right, we just started. When I'm recording this, September 29th, we started at the beginning of September, the new school year, and we call it that. We call it the new school year. Well, does that mean that it's the new year? No, but it's the new year for for the school season. So even in our own culture, we have something like this. And within the biblical uh, calendar, within the the calendar that that we're talking about, yes, Mr. Roseberg is right here that the that the first day the first day of the year is Nissan one. But when it comes to slaves, when it comes to um, leaving the the dressings for the slave or for the for the uh, poor, when it comes to uh, land going back to its own to to its own clan, within the Torah, this happens in the seventh month. So this is why you have uh, this is why the Jew, the 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 Jews call Rosh Hashanah Rosh Hashanah is because it's the beginning of the year from a different perspective. It's it's a civil new year, and that's what they call it. They call it the civil new year. Um, and then there's Shavat, which uh, fifteen, which is the. Uh, the New Year for Trees. And once again, this is not a biblical uh, New Year. However, it makes sense according to when the, the planting and, and uh, all the water was done, all the rain had already come. It makes sense. It's not biblical, but it, it makes sense. However, all I'm saying here is that Nisan 1 and Tishri 1 both could be seen as a New Year, just as we see uh, January 1 and September what 1 to something like that whenever the new year start or the the uh, school year starts we see that as well so that's that's the point and I think it's something that Mr. Roseboro has not taken into consideration here so for Patricia King to say that uh, this is a totally biblical feast no it's not Rosh Hashanah is not a biblical feast, and I would note that, however, modern-day Jews are, you know, keeping time and deciding what what is the beginning of the year and what is not. It's not in accord with Scripture. It's a completely different schema. Once again, I disagree uh, a bit with this. I mean, I, I understand what he's saying in terms of Nisan one being the the uh, first day of the year. Fair enough, but um, I, uh, once again, I think that he's missed the the fact that the land returned uh, within the seventh year, and that the the slaves went free in the seventh year. Seventh year. So, so uh, I I agree with what he's saying, but I don't think he's seeing the whole scope of things. So, this is one of the reasons that I actually don't have a problem calling Yom Teruah Rosh Hashanah. 
I don't call it that normally. I'll, I'll, I refer to it as Yom Teruah, but, there, but I don't have a problem with that because I understand that there is, in some sense, a new year. Now, it's not the the new year like we would think of like January 1st as the new year, but it is a new year within the biblical uh, within the biblical schema of things. And you'll know that the Pharisees, the true Pharisees, uh, they were not friends of Jesus. They, 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 the, the true Pharisees, they were the enemies of Christ and were co-conspirators in Christ's crucifixion. Okay, I agree with what he's saying uh, to some degree. There is debate over this, however, on uh, who exactly made up the 70 elders or the uh, Sanhedrin uh, in Acts and uh, who controlled the temple, whether or not the, uh, whether or not the, and E.P. Sanders is a, is a good resource on this, his, his Judaism from, uh, it's just called Judaism is how it's referred to, but in that book, he talks about whether or not uh, the temple uh, high priests and all those were Sadducees or whether they were Pharisees. We actually see Christ going into Pharisees' homes. So uh, I understand what he's saying. It seems as though that there were Pharisees and scribes that were following Christ around and they were opposing what he was doing. But it also seems that there was some Pharisees who uh, he's friends with. And and, uh, it seems as though one of the reasons that the Pharisees are so uh, opposing what he's doing is because he may have, and this is speculation. I, I understand this is speculation. So, but it seems as though he may have leaned towards Pharisaism in terms of the, the practice that he was doing, which is why the Pharisees are so worried about him. Um, now, of course that can be debated and, and I wouldn't, as my father always says, I wouldn't follow my sword for that belief, but, uh, it, it, I, I'm not sure I would say that all the, like Christ was the enemy of the Pharisees. He eats in, in Pharisees homes. So, uh, yeah. So you're going to know we've got a big, big, big problem here. And that is, is that Rosh Hashanah, according to the Bible, if you're going to celebrate the first of the year, you got to go all the way back to uh, the month of Nisan. Agreed. And uh, the time of the Passover, not the day of atonement. And it's here that I should point something out. And that is, is that Hebrews 9 makes it clear that for Christians, the day of atonement is has nothing whatsoever to do with um, what what the you know the Jews of uh, of the Mosaic Covenant celebrated, so here's what it says in Hebrews nine. But when Christ appeared, a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent that is not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into holy places, by means uh, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Okay, so this is an interesting, I mean, I'm not going to try to debate uh, Mr. Roseboro on the book of Hebrews at this point. However, it's an interesting concept because one of the things that I would, uh, you know, this, I I can't imagine, you know... uh, Mr. Roseboro is, is a uh, intelligent and uh, savvy uh, scholar. I, I, I don't know if he would consider himself a scholar or a pastor, neither here nor there. The point is, is that he's well-versed in the Bible. So I can't imagine that he would, say, that he would think that uh, the Jews or anyone under, what, uh, under the Mosaic Covenant were saved by keeping by doing works. I can't, I can't imagine that. And, and if he does, then uh, we have... We have some major theological problems there. So th- this obviously leads to, well, how were people saved before Christ comes and dies on the cross? And the answer is, well, they were saved by faith in Christ. And we know this because Paul uses Abraham as the model of faith, salvation by faith, right? So so uh, I agree with what he's saying is that it, it, obviously when he's reading the scriptures, you're going to agree with him, right? The, the fact is, is that uh, this ritual that the that the priest did every year to go into the holy of holies and to sprinkle the blood on the ark is just a shadow. It's not it's not going to save you. You're, but it never did. It never saved you. So why why would the you know why would David and why would Moses and why would you know anyone uh, in the you know before Christ comes why would they celebrate uh, Yom Kippur 
if it didn't save them? Well, it's because it's a picture of Christ's salvation. And what the writer to Hebrews is talking about is the thing that actually did save them, which is him dying on the cross, taking his blood into the holy of holies of the heavenly of the heavenly realm, and uh, presenting his blood to the Father. This is what saves us. Yom Kippur is just a picture of that, right? And there's nothing wrong with people wanting to celebrate that picture. In fact, I think that believers should celebrate that picture. I think that one of the things that uh, we have done in the modern Christian churches, we have disassociated ourselves from an understanding of how the biblical festivals relate to Christ. And I think that uh, if people were to celebrate these festivals more and more, they would realize these festivals are a celebration of the work of Christ on the cross. And that's the point. That's the point of the festivals. Israel was to do this picture that showed that Christ would die on the cross and that he would take the blood into the Holy of Holies once for all time. That was the whole point of it. And I think that that's still the point of it. We celebrate the festival of Yom Kippur, not because we think it's saving us, and I don't think it ever saved anyone. I don't think that the priest going in now it may it may ha- have ramifications for the nation, okay? Um, but it never saved eternal and a soul eternally. It wasn't it wasn't meant for that, and it never in uh, it never was, and I don't think it ever will be. You see, Jesus is our sacrifice. Totally agree. For Christians, the Day of Atonement is Good Friday. The- no, that's not right. That's that's incorrect, and the reason why is because Good Friday would be the day that he dies. So this, is, so for Christians, the Passover is is Good Friday to 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 Easter Sunday, right? Uh, in the modern church, the that is what Passover is. Um, now, if he wants to, so but you see once again. Uh, the biblical festival timeline, it doesn't matter where it is. One of the questions that could be asked to Mr. Roseborough is this, do you believe that Yeshua or Jesus was the Yom Kippur sacrifice, the the ultimate Yom Kippur sacrifice? The answer is yes, right? And we see this even in the book of of Hebrews, right? He, He is associated with that lamb, with that animal that is sacrificed, right? Okay, so the point is, is that yes, uh, it is a picture of when Yeshua or when Jesus now t- ascends into heaven, right? But uh, these are uh, the reason that the festivals are split into five festivals is because each one of them highlights a work that Christ does on the cross, and the work that he, and how that wor- work affects us. Okay, so each one of those five festivals does that. To say no, one of them is isn't that for Christians. I'm sorry, I, I just don't buy that. Day that Christ is crucified on the cross. Uh, yeah, so you know, you're going to note that what Patricia King is doing is it just makes no sense. So I agree with him that what Patricia King is doing is it makes no sense. We're in total agreement on that one. Um, but I think that there is a. I think that Mr. Roseboro has missed uh, some of what the some of the beauty of the biblical festivals. I've written on this on pronomian.com and why Christians should care about the festivals. I've showed, uh, there's several articles you can go find uh, in the section on biblical festivals. Uh, I've showed why Christians should uh, understand the biblical festivals. And I, and I, I mean, once again, I think that Mr. Roseboro is probably way smarter than I am when it comes to, to biblical things. But on this specific topic, I think that there has been something missed. It makes no sense under the under the new covenant, and so her claim that Rosh- okay, and, and once again we could get into full discussions of what is the new covenant in Jeremiah thirty one thirty one and following. It says that the Torah will be written on the heart. Well, what does that mean? It means that the Torah will be written on the heart. The law of God will be written on the heart. Does that include the biblical festivals? Yes, it does include the biblical festivals. And so instead of trying to throw those out or change those into all compact into three days, you know, Friday to Sunday during East, the Easter season, this doesn't make any sense. Shana is a is a biblical feast. Not true. OK, the Day of Atonement is in seventh month of the year for biblical Jews. Yeah, he's right. So so the uh, the seventh month of the year is Tishri. And that's the month that you, that so Yom Teruah is in the month of Tishri, and then so is Yom Kippur. So uh, really, 
I agree with him that uh, Yom Kippur is in the seventh month, not the first month, and he's right in that. However, once again, I think I've already described why I think that he's missing the idea of why this is a new year. And then you're going to note that the only time, and I mean this, the only time the Hebrew words Rosh Hashanah show up in Scripture is in Ezekiel chapter 40. I agree with him. And uh, from here, he he uh, he goes into different directions. So I'm going to end it here because I've been talking now for 40 minutes. I've been watching this for 40 minutes. Um, but ultimately, all of this to say, first of all, I respect Mr. Roseborough. I think that he's done some great work, but I think that he's off on this. And I think one of the things that uh, many people who oppose uh, the, the biblical festivals, the Sabbath, the kosher laws, those kind of things, one of the things that I think that they do is they're so set in, in their belief uh, that these have been done away with, that they're actually against them. And this is actually, in my opinion, not helpful. In fact, I think that if we take some scholars such as like uh, Dr. Daniel Block or uh, maybe uh, Dr. Walter Kaiser or uh, others who are or even even those who believe that they, even those who are uh, more on probably Roseboro's side, like a uh, Daryl Bach or something like that, these guys find a benefit in understanding the biblical festivals and uh, and understanding how these point to Christ. So I think that Chris has, has missed this a little bit. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Um, I hope that you've uh, enjoyed this and I hope that this has cleared some stuff up. If Chris, for some reason, if Chris makes it all the way through this video and uh, wants to discuss this, I'd be happy to talk to uh, Mr. Roseboro, uh, even on, on uh, Covenant Conversations. I think that'd be an interesting uh, discussion and one that, we could, uh, one that we could really have some fun in. And so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm open to something like that. And uh, yeah, all right. Uh, have a great day, guys. We'll see you soon.